So, Chris, it's not just kidnappers and people in a crisis we've dealt with. You know, we've had a fair few protesters in our time. Do you mm-hmm. remember Fathers for Justice? I do. I remember them well, yeah. Their MO was to dress as cartoon characters in <laughs> primarily in London. The phone call I got was, hey, Martin, Batman has scaled Westminster Abbey, which is a famous landmark, right in the heart of London, Parliament Square, full of tourists, full of uh, traffic. Apparently, he scaled Westminster Abbey and was protesting as part of Fathers for Justice. Yeah, I remember that one. I get called. Can you go down there, Martin, and negotiate with Batman? Not the sort of call you get every day. Made my way there. Crisp Saturday morning, bright sun. I walk towards the Abbey. There in front of me is Batman with a big banner, Fathers for Justice, large external balcony looking down onto Parliament Square. What were you thinking at that point? This is going to be difficult. Mm. Um, You just know it's not going to be easy. First thing he shouts down to me is, where's Robin? I just turned and walked back to the inspector and said, he's, he's asking about Robin. Apparently, Robin didn't get up the ladder quick enough and the uniform cops that were there, uh, Batman scaled the ladder first, then it was Robin behind and the, the cops grabbed Robin and nicked him. So he was currently in the cells at the, the local Nick. That, to me, again, created a problem because I knew Batman wasn't happy. It's going to be a difficult scenario. An interesting one, Martin. Um, I'm Chris White, and that's Martin Richards. And we're experienced hostage and crisis negotiators with some 40 years of experience of dealing with incidents that range from the protester that Martin's just mentioned to uh, kidnappings all over the world and terrorist environments, etc., This is another part of a series of podcasts called Convincing Conversations, where we want to help you, whatever your situation or background, to have better, more effective conversations with the people around you, whether they be friends, colleagues, loved ones, uh, supervisors. And we're going to discuss today how Batman, who's climbed up Westminster Abbey, can actually help you have a better and more productive conversation with the people around you. Yeah, and this podcast, we're going to explore difficult people. And we're... When we say difficult uh, in this context, we mean people who are demanding. They've got lots of ego. These are people that we deal with that love to be in control. You know, they don't value you that much. You don't naturally warm to them. They sometimes think that they're better than you and they treat you with with very little respect. Now, we've dealt with a lot of those people in our 30 years of policing Chris well well we certainly have and um, one of the one of the common themes through all our podcasts is is the uh, topic of empathy mm. because if we are going to move these situations in a positive direction we've got to show some empathy and it's really difficult <clears throat> because yeah. we might not agree with their cause we might find their behavior unacceptable to us to our own set of values we mm. might not just fundamentally might not like people So it's very difficult to show people empathy when we don't agree with their value set, their ethics or their behaviours, like your your Batman on on Westminster Abbey. But it is necessary because without it, you can't build rapport. And I'll give you an example, um, Martin. One of the most more recent cases that I was involved with was uh, a kidnapping. It Mm -hmm. was overseas. It involved some people who were working in the oil and gas industry and we have to deal with an individual who is representing kidnappers. So think about that for a minute. Kidnappers, people who have taken perfectly good working people, holding them in horrible situations, threatening to kill them, telling us that people are sick and dying, putting pressure on families. I mean, it's a very, very stressful situation for loved ones. Mm. And of course, how on earth can we show empathy for somebody who has, you know, orchestrated that kind of event? Because when we're dealing with this guy, he's got absolutely no empathy for me. 
mm. in my position because he's already formed an opinion of me. He's very much in control in his own mind, and I guess he is at that point. You know, he's, he's accusing me of being sensitive because all I'm concerned about is the welfare of the people that he's holding. Um, mm-hmm. he, he's not listening to my point of view because he thinks he holds all the cards and I'm just going to buckle. So he's got no interest really in what I've got to say about hostages. He just wants to know about money. He blames me and those people around me, you know, saying things like, if these people die, it's your fault. This is down to you. This is your, your, you're in control of how well they are. Of course, I'm not in control, but he's blaming me. He's not listening to anything I'm saying at that point because he's yelling and shouting and, and making demands and all the rest of it. And of course, he remembers, he remembers everything that I say that he doesn't like. So he's, you know, he's, he holds a grudge. If I let him down in any way, he holds a grudge. So he is showing absolutely no empathy. So how do we do that? I mean, I, I, I've always thought, you know, I don't know, it, you saw the film Captain Phillips. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. the film with uh, Tom Hanks. Now, yeah, yeah. That, was, that was actually, uh, I, I felt, without, you know, the experiences that we've had, I thought that was a really good film. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. a Hollywood, Hollywood movie and, and all, the, all the, you know, razzmatazz that goes with that. But it was a good film. Um, and somebody researched that pretty well. And, and you, you know, the Somali fishermen, I don't think it happens so often now, but, I mean, every, it was all over the news at one point. Somali pirates, Somali pirates. Now, it's very easy for us in our own society to condemn those people. And you look at the guy in the Captain Phillips movie, he was very well portrayed. It's very easy for us to condemn them as being pirates, you know, and all the imagery that goes with that. But if you, and I'm not saying this is right or wrong, but if you research the sort of uh, the, the the beginnings of, of Somali piracy, they will tell you that they've had to resort to piracy, hostage taking, because their fishing grounds have been completely overwhelmed by huge trawlers from global corporates, and therefore their families aren't eating. Now, in Somalia, a family might be 100 people because it's very clan and tribal based. So it's a very different value set. So if you go with that for a minute, then actually, can you empathise with somebody who has resorted to that? I think you can. It does not mean that you agree or you condone uh, or that you find the behaviour acceptable. But, but can you can you empathise with why they have arrived at that point? I think you probably can. And that was a good list of traits, people refusing to listen, <clears throat> accusing you of being oversensitive, I think you said, formulating opinions of you early. I mean, my Kate Crusader, Batman, mm. he was lacking in empathy, evidenced um, by not listening, blaming, formulating opinions. Now, we know that... It is the utmost importance on us to demonstrate empathy. In fact, it's a cornerstone of our negotiating stairway that we're going to discuss in another one of our podcast series. You know, how we demonstrate empathy through active listening. But empathy is not about being nice. I mean, you're you're not necessarily nice to that kidnapper. Mm. I'm not really that nice to Batman but it's about trying to identify that other person's situation, you know, their motives and communicating, you know, that to them. Mm. It's, it's not agreeing with them. It's trying to understand and making an attempt to get that right is, is what's important. Mm. And, you know, it's, it's not sympathy, you know, sympathy is an expression of pity, sorrow, distress of another, Mm. you know, empathy is not sympathy. And we've got to create this positive atmosphere so we can problem solve. So we don't argue. We listen with no judgment. And we acknowledge that other person's point of view, be it your kidnapper or be it Batman. I was going to say, dragging you back to uh, the Cape Crusader Batman, what did he want? I mean, what, what did he say? Did you? Did he say, you know go back to Gotham City and get Commissioner Gordon for me. I want to talk to him. (laughs) Where was he in all this? Well, this person was argumentative. He was arrogant, loads of ego. You know, he he scaled Winsminster Abbey. He tells you he's not coming down until we've met his demands. In fact, this guy's demands were 
for whoever was going to be addressing the congregation the following day, because this was Saturday, so Sunday there was a service at mm. Westminster Abbey. It was for that person to mention the cause of Batman, you know, why Batman was there. So that's his demand. So I think, yeah, like that's going to happen. Um, I mean, honestly, so many people that we've had to negotiate with, their demands that they make, they know they're not going to get honoured. And I'm sure they just make half of these up to cause us problems or they've watched too many movies. I mean, the classic is, you know, I want a million dollars and a car to take me to the airport. All right, so, Martin, we're mentioning demands. What is the most ridiculous, outrageous, outlandish demand that you think you had or or a selection of, you know, a few of many probably? The most ridiculous demand I had was five cans of baked beans in Nigeria because apparently they're hard to come by. <laughs> True story. Did you did you um, did you get the baked beans? Yeah. Did that solve um, it? I don't know whether. Um, well, he wanted money as well. I mean, mm. it, it was an, an additional thing at the end, as they often do. They they'll they have the money, but they want something else to go with it. But yeah, five cans of baked beans, not four cans, not three. Five cans. Five. five. Yeah, no. one for each day of the week. <laughs> I think my I, I well I've had I don't know I've had everything from. Getaway cars. I think I had fifty million US dollars at one point from um, mm-hmm. that. That was um, an overseas case, which was plainly ridiculous given the circumstances. I remember one case. It was actually it was in London, uh, and it was kind of young criminals against other young criminals, and and the demand started. Literally, I think they've been watching too many Hollywood movies. The demand started at sort of $3 million or we're going to start, you know, cutting fingers off, et cetera, et cetera. That case ended up that the actual demand ended up was an iPhone. That's that's where we got to, to and from, £2 million to an iPhone. And I think we were able to summon up an iPhone from somewhere else. But, yeah, helicopter, been asked for a helicopter, central London, food, that's always a good one. Indian takeaway. Um, yeah, I've had a kebab. Somebody wanted a kebab who yeah. was sitting over a, wa- uh, a railway line. Um, I think it was a track criminal. Go and get me a kebab. And and he's very particular with the sauce he wanted on it. Um, <laughs> no salad, if I remember. In fact, what, what we did there is we went and got ourselves a kebab as well. And we left his kebab where we wanted him to come down to uh, next to us on the wall. And we ate our kebabs really slowly. That's cruel. That's cruel. And That's not negotiating. That's just cruelty. (laughs) Wafting the (laughs) kebab smells towards him and saying things like, hmm, these are lovely. Lovely kebabs. Well, of course, there is a serious point to that, isn't there? Because, you know, on the one hand, if it helps to give a concession, you know, like a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or a packet of cigarettes yeah. or something, then clearly yeah. that might be a very good thing. But obviously we don't want to be feeding people because then they get comfortable and just expect more and more food. Yeah. Alcohol was yeah. always the other one. You know, oh, I need yeah. a drink. I need a drink. Well, you know, obviously you're not really going to send up a bottle of Captain Morgan, are you? But I put myself out with that kebab because I was on a no-carb diet at the time. <laughs> So I went beyond, beyond and above the call of duty. <laughs> did you eat it? Did you really eat it? Or did you just sit there looking I like I nibbled around it? the edges yeah, and just exactly. ate the meat. <laughs> <laughs> now, we've dealt with lots of people who've displayed these ego, this ego, the arrogances, some really difficult people. And there are specific ways, techniques that we've used. And feeding the ego is one such method. I mean, why not? It's what they need. But we must also be mindful mindful of allowing them to save face, you know. People often don't mean to get themselves into situations, you know, worked up or or angry. You know, we've dealt with uh, people on rooftops, Trap criminals, people, you know, wanting to end their lives, you know, attempts at suicide. 
and protesters like Batman here. And, and quite often we get to a point in our negotiations where the only reason that person is not coming down is because they can't save face. Yeah, it's absolutely crucial, isn't it? That self-esteem thing. Yeah, I mean, they, you know, the road's been blocked off, their neighbours have come out, their friends are aware of what's going on, it's on social media. It may even be, you know, on the local news. And so put yourself in that person's position. Um, they actually want to come down. Um, you know, whatever we've been dealing with, the crisis is now over. Um the criminal knows they're going to get arrested. The person who went up to end their life has changed their minds. But there's one thing keeping them up there, and that's mm. this saving face. Yeah, the dignity thing, yeah. So imagine yourself there in an argument, Chris, you know, when you're, you've got one of your friends with you or your wife, your partner with you, and it's over a parking space. Um, now... With that person who's in the car with you, it can actually be hard for you to back down because that person's looking at you to win, you know, in that scenario. So there's another example maybe where, you know, saving face can help remove mm. the audience. This is what we do in mm. our our cases. You know, we get the neighbours away, we get the public away so they can come down with some some dignity. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's also, they've got to somehow whether it's Batman or anybody else, they've also got to be convinced that that your suggestions moving forward are actually mm. to their advantage. I mean, you know, like praising their ability to make certain decisions, for example, something like that. Yeah, okay then. So Batman says to you, Chris, I want to be on the TV news channels. I want the Dean of Westminster to mention me to his congregation tomorrow what would you have said to him to convince him that, as you say, your suggestions are to his advantage and what are you going to praise him for? Well, we have to work at it, obviously. But, I mean, first thing, we can expect demands. Otherwise, we wouldn't be there. You know, we expect demands. We know we're going to get demands. Um, mm -hmm. There's all sorts of fancy names for that. But, you know, they're going to want something and we may or may not be able to get that something delivered, whether it's a cup of tea or a million pounds, you know, it's, and everything in between. Um, but, you know, we, so we can expect a demand, not only that he wants to be on the news on TV, but demands like, well, look, you know, if you try and arrest me, I'm going to jump uh, or I'm going to cause damage to the building or I'm going to set fire to something or I'm going to resist and cause injury to myself and, and your cops and this kind of thing. And as we've said, he must be convinced that any advice we give or any proposal we'll make actually resonates and is to his advantage. So, look, I mean, I, I would be thinking to try and say something like that the longer you stay here and I don't know what name you had for him what you tell me in a minute I guess whether you called him Batman or whether you actually got to the first name thing because that's always good as well the longer you stay there mate the more you will alienate the public because you're causing an inconvenience now you know you've been here you've made your point look around you you, you're not just going to get into a cab and go home now. The courts are going to look more favourably on you the shorter your enforced disruption periods last. Um, you're going to have more access to those you wish to influence after this event by pressing for face-to-face -face meetings. Um, carry on this course of action beyond the optimum stage, if you like, and your influence is going to go run out because people are, people are going to get fed up with you now and, you've just, and they'll remember you being a problem rather than remember you for having a cause that some of them may actually really empathise with. That was nice. I wish I said all of that. Good. Well, I hope you I did. Would have, I would have probably come down. <laughs> and, and look, we can praise his ability to make tough and re realistic decisions because there is that point where he is going to actually be climbing down if we can convince him that his, he's, he's peaked in his, uh, you know, his, his cause He's got the maximum publicity. He's climbing down. But in his mind, he might think this looks silly. You know, I'm not looking very dignified in my ill-fitting Batman costume and I'm climbing down now and it looks like I'm giving in. But actually, we can say, look, it's not a failure. You've actually achieved quite a lot. And again, let's be clear, we don't necessarily have to agree 
with the method, but you've actually achieved quite a lot here. And coming down certainly is not a failure. Coming down moves you to the next level of your uh, your publicity campaign. It means that you can actually talk to some of the people that feel that you might have a point. Um, it shows strength to call an end to something like this. It shows actually it shows some maturity to to say I've made my point. I'm coming down now. Um, those kind of things. So we we are always feeding the ego, maintaining the dignity, not being condescending. We're not judging, um, and we're we're praising the his his ability to make that call. Yeah, I remember also talking of success. You know, raising his self esteem. I mean, I told him that managing to scale this iconic London landmark to get on the news to bring Parliament Square to a standstill and have the Dean of Westminster listen to his demands, actually took some planning. Mm -hmm. And he's actually drawn attention to his cause. Yeah. Although if I'm really honest, he had so much self-esteem, he didn't really need uh, big enough that much. I mean, he actually believed he might actually be Batman after all. Well, maybe he was. I don't know. Maybe you're, <clears> maybe you're, <throat> maybe you're coming at this from the wrong direction. I don't know. <clears throat> But, but you're right. I mean, you know, again, whether we whether we agree with it or whether we don't, he did manage to. I'm not sure I could successfully scale uh, or climb up the outside of Westminster Abbey without being spotted. I hope I couldn't anyway. But he managed it, and that and you're right. That did take planning, a, l a lot of planning, I would imagine. And he and he attracted, as you say, he attracted uh, uh, media comment. I don't know how many, how diverse the group of tourists would be in Parliament Square on a Saturday morning. But I guarantee you, you're going to have people from all corners of the earth and they are going to be seeing this guy and probably did um, reading his banner and all the rest of it. And obviously it's on the news. London's watching. Mm -hmm. The world's watching because I don't know who was there. Sky, BBC, no doubt. And a lot of those people would be agreeing with what he was saying. Exactly. So this example of Batman is not obviously it's not one that presents itself to many. And I doubt whether you've had to deal with Batman more than that occasion, I wouldn't have thought. But managers and team leaders often have to have well-being conversations with their colleagues and staff, probably more mm -hmm. so now after pandemic, in more difficult circumstances, remotely. And some of those people are going to be very difficult. So someone at work who doesn't want to disclose the actual issue that's causing them stress and in my experience, the real issue with someone who's suffering emotional problems doesn't get disclosed straight away. It always comes later when they're ready to disclose it. They don't want to disclose the actual issue. So, you know, they'll, they'll come and say, look, I can deal with this myself. Uh, they're just notif notifying you out of respect and a bit of box ticking in case uh, you notice a change in behavior. But, you know, they're OK they don't want to take advice. In fact, they dismiss the advice. They just see it as a, a weakness in asking for emotional help. But going back to the point we've just talked about, they must be convinced that your advice as the leader, the manager, the friend is to that person's advantage. So, you know, I, I might say, look, by talking about your concerns, we can get you some assistance together. I'm not doing it to you. we will do it with you um, because it sometimes helps to share a problem. We can refer you to external help or, or, or even internal help if it's there. And remember, to praise their ability to make tough and realistic decisions, they've actually, they didn't wake up that morning and think, oh, I've got, uh, I'm, I'm suffering, my mental fitness isn't very good. It's probably been carried for quite some time. So to take that step is really important. It's the first we've heard of it, as leaders may be, but it's not the first they've experienced it. It might have been days, weeks, months, or sometimes even years. So, you know, saying, validating that by saying it takes courage to talk about these things. It's brave for you to discuss your emotions and how you feel, you know, because it's something that there is still stigma attached to that, which we're trying to break down. But it takes strength mm -hmm. to admit you have dark thoughts, you know, you, and you make the decision and you are making the decision as to what assistance you require. Yeah, and I might also feed the ego of that person that you were just discussing, you know, allowing them to feel in charge, you know, saying things like you've got the right to decline the advice, you decide what you want to discuss, you can stop the discussion at any time, everything's confidential, 
no one needs to be aware of what we're talking about unless you wish to share. And should you wish to change your mind or decline the support, that's okay. You know, no one's going to think less of you. And if they're worried about others finding out about what we're talking about, we need to also help them save face. You know, we can tell the rest of the team, for example, that what we were discussing about is something completely different. And if they're going to go sick or wish to change shifts, as an example, we can come up with other stories, you know, around that. Yeah. To, to help them save face. Yeah, uh, protect, that, protect that dignity. I mean, I remember, uh, well, it seems a long time ago now, but it was only last year. We were, you, you'll remember this. When, you remember we were advising parents mm-hmm. in lockdown and we did some Zoom, uh, yeah. Zoom casts, et cetera. And, and most of the challenges in a lot of homes, not all, but a lot, were dealing with uh, children mainly young mm. teenagers wanting to break the rules, meet up with their friends. And we actually suggested some of these tips. Yeah, uh, raising their self-esteem of their children, for example. So we were we were suggesting that the parents would say things like, you know, you've coped with lockdown. It's, up, it's been four weeks now. You've remained distant from your friends. It took a lot of effort. And not everybody has managed to be so patient. And as we've been saying about dealing with difficult people, you know, convincing them that your advice is to their advantage. Mm. So we were suggesting to the parents to say to their children, um, say to them things like staying in and away from your friends a little longer will help to keep granny safe, for example, Mm. and save other lives. Mm. And we as parents would ensure that you receive more of, I don't know, Xbox. You're allowed to watch more of your programs on TV, for example. So we're convincing them that your advice, again, is to their advantage. Yeah. Yeah. And praising the ability to make difficult decisions as well. You know, you've been, you've, I know, we know that you've been prevented from pursuing your hobbies, whatever those hobbies may mm. be. But you've managed to begin yeah. new ones. You've discovered new interests. That shows spirit, shows resilience. And, of course, the saving face thing may not be saving face with us, the parents, uh, the yeah. elders, but it will be saving f- uh, face with their own peer group. And that's and that's tough. But, um, you know, some of them, some of their friends will be out breaking the rules and, and they'll feel the weak ones because they're, they're not. Yeah. But it's okay to say um, to, to children, Look, it's all right. Tell your friends that we've stopped you from meeting up. But you can also yeah. say what the extra benefits that have come out of that have actually been. Um, you know, what you've actually gained from not meeting up and not doing so for another few weeks or, or months um, or mm. whatever the case may be. But anyway, I don't want to let you off the hook here, Martin. Let's get back to Batman. Did any of these um, did any of these tips help? What happened? <laughs> well, it's important to stress, Chris, that this is only a very small part of our conversation. Uh, toolbox that we've got you know we have to demonstrate a lot of active listening uh, with these techniques some careful questioning some emotional labeling all of which we we share in other podcasts but i like to think actually yes it did help you know it's it's a structure to hang your conversation on and you can use this as a as a checklist you know which i did do although saving face was something I sense wasn't quite required here because he had no qualms about the publicity uh, or coming down, in fact, when, when he was ready. Convincing him that my advice, again, was to his advantages, praising his ability to make his decisions, feeding his ego time after time. You know, he came down eventually. But it was quite obvious very early on with this encounter, though, you know, what I was going to be up against. There was going to be ego here. There was going to be a need uh, for him to be in control mm-hmm. and arrogance that, that I knew I'd be faced with. I mean, he's dressed as Batman after all. But, you know, if the person you're talking to is not dressed up as a cartoon character, there are other quick ways that I know we can establish what sort of person we're dealing with and how they see themselves in their relationship with us by the actual words that they use. Yeah, there are, and and it's um, it's a it's a good tip if we can by listening to the words really really carefully, we can assess 
where you are and where this other person is in terms of the relationship with you at that particular mm-hmm. time and and then to work out how you need to change that dynamic so you know for example someone says um, and we've both been there you know you're on top of a building somebody's in deep deep personal crisis and they say look you can't help me you cannot help me i am absolutely at a loss i'm useless i've failed Everybody and everything will be better off without me. And whatever you say will not change that situation. That person at that time has very, very little self-esteem, like zero really, feels terribly depressed, feels very uh, morose and, and demonstrates it. And furthermore, worryingly, absolutely is not open to persuasion or influence from you in any way at all. So, you know, there's a big minus sign in that person's head for themselves and a big minus sign that he puts on you. And that's really difficult to change because you've got to introduce a plus sign, a positive to that, which obviously is what, what we would, what we would seek to do. And we'll talk about some of those techniques in other, in other podcasts. Okay. So how about, uh, listen, Chris, you don't know me. Okay. You know, nothing. Um, I know what to do. Uh, I'm fine. Don't worry about me. And I, and I certainly don't need your advice. Mm. Well, yeah, a difficult one. Quite, you know, this is the big A. This is your Batman. This is, you know, certainly, oh, yeah. At the, yeah. certainly at the outset, because in his head is a massive plus about him. Mm-hmm. He's, he's the, uh, you know, he's the one that is sitting above you, metaphorically speaking. You know, everything, everything is better as far as he's concerned. He's better than you. You're there and you're a slight irritation, really, because you're getting in the way. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's where you are. So using some of the techniques we've talked about, we need to balance that seesaw because at the moment you have a big minus sign uh, that he has put on you and a big plus Mm -hmm. sign that he's put on him. Uh, So we need to work hard through things like empathy and listening and the skills that we that we talk about. Uh, We need to change that minus to a bit of a plus and then we can start dealing at a, at a better level, dare I say, a more sort of adult, um, mm-hmm. because mature level. The other thing, of course, is the other one. You've got the person who says, everything you do is better than me. You seem to always get what you want. I'm useless at this. I fail all the time. You, you probably can help me, I'm sure. I wish I had all your luck and all your opportunities. So this person has a big minus sign in their own head that they've given themselves, but everybody mm-hmm. else is plus. I'm I'm a failure, and but everybody else. So with that person, it the, we have to we have to build the positivity in them rather than in us. So this all it's very subtle, um, and the skills we use help us to do this. But you know, just having a a little bit of a, a means of assessing what are the dynamics of this relationship right now um, can actually help to think where do I need to go? What skills do I need to use? How am I going to redress the balance? Because where mm-hmm. we all want to get to is, you know, well, I was going to say the conversations you and I always have, but you know, they're not they're not always that way, um, especially when you're making fun of me for things. But anyway, that's because I'm, I'm better than you, Chris. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, I've well, got we... a big plus side over my head. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. But where we, where we want to be, of course, is where both people have a plus sign, both for themselves mm. and mutually given and taken. And they, well, are, they are, yeah, and they are the conversations that we want to be having. And they're fortunately, they're the conversations that a lot of people have every day. You know, this isn't, you know, we're talking about, um, you know, I hope the minority of situations that we get called to. But, you know, we can identify this as a point that you're listening to what I'm saying. I'm listening to what you're saying. We give it credibility. We're mutually respectful. Uh, we're both demonstrating empathy for one another's positions. And actually, we're feeling quite good. It doesn't mean you can't disagree. But we're actually feeling pretty good and positive about our own position, firstly, and the position of the other person. So there's a natural rapport there without too much effort. Um, And that's where we try and get to in all our critical negotiations. You know, the level seesaw where I'm talking to you and you're listening and respecting and you're talking to me and I'm listening and respecting. And that's where we try and get to. We use the negotiation stairway, as you mentioned earlier on, to do that. And slowly but surely, we're going to unpack that stairway and tell people how it works. Well, with Batman, 
We did actually get to that point of mutual respect, I'd like to think. Mm. We, we built up a really good rapport. Um, he began to trust me. We had some quite actual meaningful conversations about divorce and child access. It actually might have helped that I was actually going through a divorce at the time. But he did need lots of praising. He did need lots of convincing that my suggestions were, were to his advantage, that's for sure. You know, in the end, he, he came down. Mm. Um, I never did see Robin. Um, I don't know what happened to him. So, well, I mean, we well, well it? done. Well done on that because, you know, I mean, there's a slightly humorous point, you know, it's Batman and the rest of it, but it is a very serious thing. And and whatever you were asked to do in the full glare of Sky, BBC, uh, the police, um, the public and all that stuff, um, you know, you turned up there to a very difficult situation thinking this is going to be hard, but you succeeded. Yeah, I think he... He went on to do Buckingham Palace. Buckingham Palace, yeah, if he did. I remember, right. yeah. And then Spider Man went up Tower Bridge. So we had the full set, I think, around London landmarks mm. with cartoon characters. Um, and then it all stopped. I don't know why, mm. Um, mm. but you know that was a bit different for a while. Okay, so on this podcast, what have we talked about? So let's recap. We talked about what empathy is and your list of what it isn't and how to identify when someone has a lack of empathy. We The need to convince people that our suggestions are to their advantage, to praise people, you know, when they've got to make difficult decisions the real importance of feeding ego. And finally, we talked about how to identify how that person views their relationship with you by the actual words uh, that they use. So when dealing with someone who displays a lack of empathy, is dismissive of any advice, and sees themselves as better than you, then try these tips because they can only help. Great stuff. So I'm Chris White and he's Martin Richards. On the Convincing Conversations podcast today, we've been talking about dealing with difficult people. If you like what you've heard, please go and leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts and share it with your friends and help them have better conversations too. It all really does make a difference. Please subscribe and look out for the next podcast, which is called Stressful Conversations and Addressing Risks. And in that episode, I'm called to a bank robbery that goes wrong and ends up with a suspect armed with a weapon and explosives and a hostage trapped inside the bank.